Good morning, Celebration Church. Hey, before we do anything, let's welcome everybody who's joining us online as well as our correctional facilities. We welcome you, are our guest of honor. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, Pastor Joe and Pastor Lori and some of the team right now is over in Europe and they're ministering to some churches through a ministry that we have at Celebration Church called Strong Church. And it's where we equip and, and empower and impart into pastors all over uh, Europe. Our Italy location pastors are up there as well as some of the other team. Ryan Brown, who is a part of our staff, who's launching a church in Spain. They're all there. And so it's an awesome time. It's important for us, I believe, as a church with our influence. God has anointed our pastors to speak into the lives of others. And so we get a part as a church. We're a part of shaping what God is doing over in that part of the world as well. And I want to encourage you again to be here this Wednesday for our live recording. Our Pursuit Night is going to look a little different because there's a lot of these songs that we're singing that you're like, I can't find these online. It's because we haven't recorded them yet. All right? But we're going to record them this Wednesday. We're going to get those songs. They're songs written in our church. They're songs of our house. And they speak to the prayers that we pray for here. And so we want to encourage you to be here. Central Austin location is going to be here. Leander Liberty Hill is going to be here. And we're all going to worship together. Now, as a church, we have been committed in 2024 to become strong Christians. We committed to giving God a year for spiritual formation, uh, for spiritual development, uh, so that we can have a significant impact in what God is doing, not only here in the Central Austin area or Central Texas area, but over in Europe, over in Africa, wherever else God would send us. And so in order for us to be strong Christians, we have to have a good understanding about the importance of worship. So today, within the Strong Christian Framework, we're going to begin a new series called Worth Ship. And so as we kick into the series, if you have your Bibles here with you today, I'm going to ask that you open up to Psalm. Just go right to the middle and then take a little bit left and you'll hit Psalm 100 is where we're going to go. If you don't have your Bible, open your YouVersion app. We'll also have it on the screen. Now, I'm going to warn you ahead of time. I'm going to be all over the Bible today, all right? We're going to go all the way from Genesis to Revelation by the end of this thing. And I know that's going to be challenging sometimes for you to be able to keep up, follow along, write the notes. We'll have it on the screen, but we've done something special. On our celebration.church website, if you go to our front page and scroll down a little bit, you'll see a strong Christian button. Click on that and scroll down a little bit, and you're going to see a place where we're going to provide today's notes. In fact, they'll already be there for you. We're going to give you all the comprehensive notes of today's message. So if you miss something today and you're like, man, I need to find that or I miss that scripture, just go to our website, and we'll have that all available just to make it easier for you. All right? I talk fast, and I talk loud, and it might be hard to keep up. But let's go to the scripture, all right? I want to read here from my brand-new Bible that has Honolulu Blue Go Lions. Come on, if you know, you know. This is the only reason why I bought this Bible is because of this right here. That's how vain I am. No, I'm just kidding. I just love my lions. We had a good year. Why can't I celebrate? We haven't ever had one. So it's been great. This is another reason to praise the Lord. Amen. Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Come on, church. If you're thankful for the goodness of God this morning, I want you to give him your best praise. I want you to give him a shout in this place because he's been so good to us. He's so worthy of our praise. God, we thank you first and foremost because you're good, because you're God, and you're worthy of it all. Lord, we thank you. We worship you, God, and we give you all praise today, Lord. And it's with this posture, God, that we come to your word, and we ask, God, that you speak to us, that you would highlight things in Scripture, that you'll give us revelation, not for the sake of knowledge and information, but for the sake of life application so we can live out worship in everyday life. We thank you in advance for who you are and all you do in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. Come on, let's give God one more hand. So the question of the day 
What is worship? Well, Webster defines worship as the feeling or expression of reverence or adoration for a deity, honor given to someone in recognition of their merit. But I want to focus our, our definition to our context, which is this. Worship means to affirm or ascribe supreme worth or value, all right, to someone, God, our God, or a lowercase God, or to something, an idol, something that takes the place of God. This is a definition that we are going to hinge today's scripture or today's sermon upon. And it's simply, you can simply think about it like this. The thing that consumes your mind throughout the day is the thing that you worship. The thing that you wake up thinking about, you think about throughout the day, you think about before you go to sleep, is the thing that you worship. Now, we as people are particularly gifted in this area because we have the ability to worship the right things and the wrong things. Last week, my youngest daughter, Kaya, and I are sitting in, uh, in the kitchen at the kitchen. I'm at the kitchen table. She's in the living room laying down on the couch. And all of a sudden, we hear the siren song of the ice cream truck coming through the neighborhood. All right? How many of that takes you right back to your childhood? We don't see a lot of ice cream trucks, trucks anymore. But we heard the ice cream, ice cream truck coming down, and I look at Kaya, and she looks at me, and we're like, nah. We're not going to do this. And she's like, no, I'm good. I'm just going to lay here. We're like, okay. Well, he slowly turns the corner and starts coming through our neighborhood. And we just hear the song playing. And then we look at each other again. And she looks at me. And we're like, no, we're going to make the right decision. And we're not going to eat junk. Like, we're not going to do this. We're good. It's all good. Well, 30 seconds goes by. And the music's still playing. All right? 60 seconds goes by. And the music's still playing. I'm like, what is going on? 90 seconds goes by. And finally, I go to the kitchen window, and I look through the blinds and look out. And that chump is parked right in front of our house. And he's waving at me as I look out the window. (laughs) How many know it didn't take long where I was out seven or eight bucks, sitting at the kitchen table eating a Ninja Turtle ice cream pop, the one with the gumball eyes, you know, you get that, or the SpongeBob pop, or one of those weird, you know. How many are like your bomb pops? I'm gonna go for the bomb pop at the. We got bomb. How many are you? You're the orange sherbet push-up pops. Like we're gonna do the push-up pops. Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Well, I tell you what, you ain't gonna lose a whole lot of weight eating this kind of uh, these kind of ice cream pops. You're not gonna be skinny dipping in the summer. You know what I mean? For me, it don't matter because I don't skinny dip. I chunky dunk. You know what I'm saying? How many chunky dunkers we got in the place? Hey, hey, you don't gotta raise your hand because we can see you. All right, we know. All right, but I'm right here with you. All right. I tell people, hey, man, I don't carry no weight in my arms or my legs. It's all right here. You know, it's a blessing of God. I'm full of His Spirit. And I'm thankful. Because the reality is, is that every one of us has an upward calling and a downward craving. And it started all the way back in the beginning. When we go to Genesis, if you have your Bibles, you can go there. Just go open it and go all the way to the left, all right? If you can't find Genesis, you are far from the Lord. And, but we're going to get you back on track today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says, God says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We established right at the beginning that we are created beings. We are created by God, which means if we're created by God, we're created for a purpose, for a reason. God creates man in the midst of the Garden of Eden. Within the Garden of Eden, there is so much, but Two things in particular. One is there is the tree of life. The tree of life contains this particular fruit that if you eat it, you will live forever. In fact, if you're near the tree of life, wherever the tree of life is, you will live forever, all right? So the issue with sin entering the garden, the reason why Adam and Eve had to be removed is because they sinned, they would have been forever living, condemned, separated from God within the garden. So God removes them out of the garden, all right? There's just a little theological premise for you, and you can study that on your own time. But there's this other tree that is sitting in the garden that's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and God has told them okay don't mess with this tree all right so in Genesis chapter 3 we fast forward you'll notice that Genesis 1 is kind of a zoom out poetic 
big picture of creation. And then within two and three, it begins to zoom in into the specifics and, and, and get into the micro there. So Genesis 3 in verse 1 says, now the serpent. The enemy, the accuser, Satan. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Notice uh, that the enemy isn't trying to get us to commit some action, some immoral action, some sinful action. He is trying to get us to question the character of God. And if we will question the character of God, we will most definitely sin. You will be like God the moment that you eat of this. We sing songs like this all the time. God, I want to be with you. God, I want to draw near to you. God, I want to be, I want to be like you. Romans even says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Isn't the goal of all this to be like Christ? Isn't that the goal? Yet, oftentimes, we are deceived into thinking that we are Christ. And that this whole world and everything that happens in it revolves around us. And so the woman sees that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to her eyes and desirable to make one wise. And so she took of its fruit and she ate it. And then she gives it to her husband who's standing right next to her when all this is going on. Hello. She so hands it to him and he eats it. And the Bible says that immediately both of their eyes are open and they knew that they were naked and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from his presence. The goal of the enemy is to keep you in hiding from the presence of God. The goal of the devil is his goal to keep you from worshiping God, his desire is that you would worship anything else but not worship God. He wants you to rob God of worship. But God is jealous, the Bible says, for his worship. And more specifically, God wants to receive his worship from us. And we were specifically created to worship God. We're going to talk about that here in the moment. But I want you to understand something. That does not mean that God needs our worship. We have to understand scripturally that God does not need us to worship him. John 17, 5, Jesus is speaking to the Father God. And now, O Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. This relationship, this fellowship I had with you before I, 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 I manifested in the flesh on this world, in this world. And then in verse 24 of John 17, he says, Father, I desire that they, they being the disciples and, and, and broadly speaking us, I desire that they also whom you gave to me will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. You love me before the foundation of the world. The Trinity, the Godhead has always loved each other, has always honored, has always served each other long before anything that was created was ever created. So God did not create us because he needed us. God does not lack anything. He didn't create us because he was lonely. God created us for his glory. God created us to represent his glory on the earth. In John 1, it says that John the Baptist was not the light. He came to bear witness to the light. We are here to bear witness to the glory of God and represent him on this earth. Isaiah 43 uh, lets us know this in verse 7. Everyone who is called by, name, by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I formed them. I made them. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whatever it is that you eat or drink or whatever it is that you do, do it all to the glory of God. Come on, I love this scripture. You better believe the next time at Chew I'm at Chewy's, I'm going to eat this Chewy Changa to the glory of God. I'm going to worship God and I'm going to thank him for all he is. Because here's the thing, here's what brings joy to this. This fact uh, guarantees that our lives are significant. 
Because you might hear me say that God does not need us to worship, and then you can surmise that there is no importance or no value to your life. But Scripture doesn't say that. Scripture says that we are created to glorify God. And that is the final definition of genuine significance for our lives. Not that God needs us, but that He wants us. That He desires for us to worship Him. What greater fulfillment than you need to know that you're wanted by the Most High God? Now, I have people in my family, and I have kids that we gave birth to. I didn't choose them. We just had them, and now I'm stuck with them. And I'm trying to do the best I can, and I thank God that they're good kids, and they have a great mom. And... But when you're adopted into a family, you're chosen. It's a different feeling to know that you're chosen, that a person has chosen to love you versus having to love someone they didn't get a choice in, right? You know, you know that whole thing. You know, I do love my kids with all my heart, and you do too if you have kids in, in the space. And if you are kids, you are loved by somebody, I promise. But it's a, it's a, for kids who have been adopted into my family, it's a different thing. It feels different to be chosen and to be brought in. It feels different to be wanted than to be needed. Because there's people in my life that need me, but they don't necessarily want me all the time. But how many know it feels good when someone says, hey, man, why don't you come out and hang out with the guys? Or why don't you come out with the girls? Like, we want you to be here. It's not going to be the same without you. I'm like, all right, I'll go. I'll go. You know, and, and so it's, you want to be wanted, right? And so this fact guarantees the significance of our lives that we, we praise God for his exploits. At the Red Sea, uh, uh, when Israel crosses the Red Sea in Exodus, they declare who is like God, uh, the God of all gods. Like who can make war with this God? Who can stand? He is the God who crushes his enemies. Nobody can make war with him. Praise was their grateful response to God's miraculous works. But worship is our response to God's character. So the devil wants us to question God's character because his character is tied directly to our worship. So what is our purpose in life? Let me tell you, you don't got to go on YouTube. You don't got to go on TikTok. You don't got to peruse a Barnes and Noble in the self-help, you know, section. I'm going to tell you what your purpose is right now because the Bible reveals it to us. Our purpose in life is to fulfill the reason that God created us. And that is to worship him. That's why when we are worshiping God, we're never more fulfilled. That's why you never regret coming to church and worshiping God and giving him your all. That's why when you're in the presence of God, man, you feel like you can climb every, any mountain. You feel like you can conquer any battle. That's why when you walk out of here, you're filled with hope. And you're filled with, yeah, you might be convicted sometimes. But you walk out of here saying, not only do I need to change, but I can change by the power of the Holy Spirit. I feel like God is equipping me and he's helping me. He's giving me revelation to be able to do this. Our job, our, 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 our reason, our purpose for living is to worship him. Which is really cool because this means that we're significant. We're not being picked last, all right? We're not being looked over. We're not the leftovers. You're important to God because he's created you to glorify him. And worship is valuable to God. Let me tell you why. Worship from us is valuable to God because it's the only thing that we can give him that he did not give us first. It's like, okay, I can, I can give him my time, but he's the one who gave us time. I can give him my life, but he's the one who breathed life into us. I can give him my money, but he's the one who gave us money. It's like, but Daniel, I thought that giving is an act of worship. Pastor Ken talked about that giving is an act of worship. Yeah, just like singing is an act of worship. It's, it's, it's worship, but it's not the amount of money or the quality of the voice that makes it worship. It's the heart. It's the attitude. It's the obedience that makes it worship. That's why the woman with the two coins, when she gives it to Jesus, uh, uh, she's made fun of, of the disciples, and Jesus rebukes the disciples, and he blesses her because he knew that the offering was substantive, not based on the amount that she gave, but based on the obedience obedience that was in her heart based on her heart's posture to God he said she has given everything to me but if worship is valuable to God if worship is valuable to the king it is also valuable to the enemy if he wants to keep us worship from worshiping God and keep us from entering the presence of God and he says that the day that you eat of this fruit you will be like God who is like God? Who can make war with God? 
And so we need to understand a little bit of the motivation of Satan to get a revelation of how he tries to keep us from the presence of God. Understand first that Satan, the accuser, was not always Satan. He was not always the serpent. He was not always the accuser, the, the liar, the deceiver of the brethren. Originally, his name was Lucifer. And he was a created angel. And in fact, the Bible says that he is one of the most beautiful of all of God's creations. When we go to the prophetic book of Ezekiel chapter 28, we see that he is speaking uh, 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 filled with the Holy Spirit about a king of Tyre, about an earthly king. But then somewhere in this particular text, we see something shift in the reading. It's like he's talking about an earthly king, and then all of a sudden he starts saying stuff that doesn't relate to an earthly king. It's because there's something in that moment that happens uh, in the supernatural that shifts his attention from an earthly king. And God says, that's not who I'm really talking about. I want you to zoom out and see something greater that's happening in eternity. And so he, he, he speaks of Lucifer, and we're going to fast forward to 12, uh, 28, 12 in Ezekiel. He says, you were the seal of perfection. In other words, uh, if God were to take all his creations at the time and say, man, which one am I going to put up uh, and show off? And Like Lucifer would have been that. You were the seal of perfection. You had God's seal on you, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. This is how we know he's not talking about an earthly king anymore, all right? He's talking about something supernatural. We've zoomed out. You were in Eden, the garden of God. The worksmanship of your timbrels. Timbrels are a type of instrument, kind of like a tambourine, percussion. And pipes, you know, when you think of woodwinds and you think of brass, for those of you who are kind of uh, band people, um, it was all prepared for you on the day that you were created. Lucifer was, was, was uh, uh, this worshiper. He was in charge of this music. And you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until... Iniquity was found in you. Sin was found in you. And what was this sin? Well, we know throughout the scriptures that this sin was the sin of pride. That when you're the most beautiful of all creation, but you're not God, all of a sudden you feel like, but if I am God's most prized, then I feel like I deserve some attention too. And you notice how pride doesn't start in a big way, but pride kind of sneaks up and attacks you from the back. And by the time you realize that it's hit, it's already got you. And so iniquity was found in him. Lucifer, he was a great angel with a great responsibility. He was the seal of perfection with instruments, timbrels, percussion, P uh, uh, pipes, you know, uh, like, like brass, like this, this fanfare, this royal fanfare. He used this to worship, to glorify God, but it was his beauty. It was his perfection that made him vain and that filled him with, with pride. And he goes to war with heaven. Well, let me tell you, one person you better never go to war with is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we see how this plays out in Scripture because Isaiah, another prophet in verse 14, beginning in verse 12, uh, in chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart that I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. Well, the moment that you eat of it, he knows you will be like God. But who is like God? Who can make war with God? I will be like God. Notice the progression when pride begins to fill, when our self-centeredness begins to take control of our lives. But the prophet knows how this is going to end. And he says in verse 14, yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the grave, uh, the lowest depths of the pit. And so the Bible speaks of Lucifer as an angel. In fact, the Bible speaks of three angels by name. All right, we see angels appearing all, all over the Bible, but there's three in particular uh, uh, that it speaks to by name that have great authority and have a particular stewardship 
Um, it's an inferred kind of angelic structure that mimics our actions in the church today and in the church throughout history. So in no particular order, we'll start with the angel Gabriel. Gabriel is a seraphim who sits in the presence of God. That's the seraphim's job. And he's, he is the steward of the words of God. So over and over, he is bringing God's words to people. He brings it to Daniel in the Old Testament. He brings it to Mary when he announces that you are going to, to give birth to the Messiah. He brings it to Joseph and he says, no, I promise, she really is a virgin and she's going to give birth to the Messiah because you know that dude was questioning some stuff, right? And, and he's the one who goes to the shepherds and he says, he says no, the Messiah is born, come and worship him like he is the steward of God's word. We have Michael, who is the archangel. He is the leader of the angelic armies of heaven. He is responsible for uh, uh, fighting on behalf of God's people, spiritual warfare. All right? Well, how do you battle in the spirit as believers? Through prayer. Through prayer. So Michael is the steward over prayer in the angelic ranks. And now we have a Lucifer. Lucifer is a different classification of angel. He is a cherubim, which is a covering angel. So they have some particular uh, uh, governance of territory or areas um, with, within the context of, of the angelic ranks. And, and he's in, he has access to God's presence as well. And the Bible says throughout everything we've talked about, his beauty covered in stones, these instruments that, that, that he leaves, that he's the angelic steward of worship, okay? So we have the word, we have prayer, and we have worship. Same as we have in the context of our worship services uh, today. However, we know that Lucifer wanted to be God, and so he was cast out of heaven. Because what was on the inside of him was sinful, all right? And so now there's a vacancy in this stewardship of worship. But here's the issue. God is still worthy to be worshipped. All right? So he doesn't go to LinkedIn to try to find another angel to fill the vacancy. He doesn't register the kingdom business with a local job fair. No, he's not doing any of that kind of stuff. The Bible says that on the sixth day... God created man from the dirt. From the place of the fallen, God brings life. And instead of timbrels and percussion of heaven, God gives man hands and he gives him feet to be able to worship and to be able to stomp and to be able to glorify the Lord. And instead of pipes, he gives him vocal cords and he gives him lungs and he gives him windpipes to be able to exalt and sing the songs of heaven and to glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there is no more a vacancy of the stewardship of heaven because God has created mankind now to fill the vacancy. So let me explain something to you. You want to know why the enemy hates you? He hates you because you took his job. He hates you because he used to be able to enter the presence of God and now he's been cast out. And here we are week after week, moment after moment, day after day, we come into the presence of God to exalt him and to clap and to sing and he receives every ounce that we're willing to give him. And is it wrong for God to receive glory? Is it wrong for God to fill this vacancy? Absolutely not. Because he's God and he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be worshipped. Now, if, if man were to seek glory for himself, it would be wrong because man is sinful. Like we are sinful. When, ma when man takes for himself, he's robbing God of glory. But when God takes glory for himself, who is he robbing? Like who, who is he robbing? Jesus, when he comes to earth, he said he did not, he did not uh, 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 declare it as robbery. He did not see it as robbery to wrap himself in the clothing of humanity and come down and live amongst us. Why? Because we were, we're beneath him. We're the created, man. We're not the creator. And, and, and I know for those of you who are parents, it's like, man, well, I've created some kids. It's like, no, those kids were created long before they came out of your womb. Like the Bible says that before you were ever born, I knew you. They, that God has a relationship with us. Like, like we are the created. Revelation 4.11 says that God is worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now here's the thing. It's the only reason why we are able, why we are allowed 
why we have the capability to come and to worship God is because Jesus redeemed us through the cross and the resurrection. Because when we were fallen, we were no different than the serpent. We were no different than Satan. We were no different than the enemy. In fact, the Bible declared us enemies of God when we were lost in our sin. But it is our knowledge of Christ and, and through Christ's redemption and, 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 and claiming and, and abandoning our lives to receive Christ that allow us to come into the presence of God. But we're still in this flesh, right? And our flesh, our flesh is weak. And so God wrapped himself up in our flesh to live a sinless life and to overcome our flesh. But yet while he was still in our flesh, this fallen devil, this fallen angel who deceived mankind into falling now tempts Jesus. And we go to the gospel of Matthew. And I encourage you to read this whole chapter in Matthew because it, it's such a master class from Jesus and how to respond to the temptations of the devil. But we'll fast forward in it to verse 8. And it says, again, the devil took Jesus up on an exceedingly high mountain. And he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you will fall. Isn't that interesting? I will give you all of this. If you will fall. What he's saying is, if you will be like me. For the moment you take of the fruit, you will be like God. But who is like God? Who can make war with him? I will be like God. Bow down and worship me. I am God. Now this sounds so profound in the context of, of Scripture, but the reality is, is we do this all the time. When we think that everything in life is supposed to revolve and rotate around us. You're supposed to do what I say. The world is supposed to act in according to the way that, accordance to the way that I want it to act. Because we may not be so bold as to say, I am God, but we're saying it with every thought, deed, and action. But Jesus models for us how to respond. And he says to the devil, away with you, Satan. For it is written that you shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you serve. And on this declaration, the devil leaves, and the Bible says that the angels come to minister to Jesus. Because here's the fact, Jesus is God. So he's not doing this because he's lesser than God the Father. He is doing this because he is modeling for us the importance of where to point our worship. Not to self, but to God. But day after day, through temptation and provocation, the devil comes and he pokes at you to see if the worship that comes out of you is authentic or counterfeit. Yeah, it was authentic in Christ. Like, yes, absolutely. But with us, we have to understand that God deserves all of our worship, not just a part of it. Which isn't just singing, right? It's, it's so much more than singing. It's obedience. It's love. It's honor. It's generosity. It's serving. It's how we lead our families. It's how we run our business. It's how we apply ourselves in school or university. It's how we apply ourselves at work. It's how we live amongst friends who don't know uh, uh, Christ. It's how we act when we're at the HEB or how we act when people cut us off on I-35. Hello, somebody. It, it, it's all worship unto God. And here's the thing, when I, but when I think about singing and I think about coming into his presence, I feel like, man, that's the easiest thing to do. Because it's hard for me some days to lead my family righteously. When they're in the back seat and I get cut off on I-35. I'm not always the best example. There's a reason why I don't got a Jesus fish or a Celebration Church sticker on the back of my truck. You know what I'm saying? I don't want you to know who I am. Because I'm at war with this, this other Daniel inside of me. This downward craving. And, and I, I wrestle with him because I know I have an upward calling. And, I, and I'm fighting it. But, but when I come into the presence of God and I won't even sing. I can't even give him that. How can I give him any other part of my life? 
It's like, I don't see, I don't like these songs. I don't like this. I don't know the songs that they're singing. Like, I don't want to sing. I don't, I, I don't, you know, I want them to sing this song. I don't want, the reason why I don't go there is because I don't like the music. I don't like the, let me tell you something. When these guys were preparing the song list today, you were the last person they were thinking about. Because we don't come to worship you. We come to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be adored. He's worthy to be glorified. He deserves it and he's created us to do that. And so the inconvenience doesn't matter. I think it was pretty inconvenience, inconveniencing to be nailed to a cross. Feels like an inconvenience. Doesn't feel like balance. Please. When you're a son of a missionary, don't come talk to me about balance. This isn't about balance. I'll get my balance on the other side of heaven. This side of heaven, I'm here to teach people the word of God. I'm here to evangelize the nations. I'm here to worship God in this context. Because here's the thing, when we worship God in this world, yes, we do have suffering. Yes, we do have pain. Yes, we do have trials. But this is a worship, when we worship God through pain, when we worship God through trials, when we worship God through challenges, it's valuable to God because it's worship that we can only give God on this side of eternity. There will be a moment where we will be in heaven and we'll never be able to give God this kind of worship again. Is it authentic or is it counterfeit? The Bible speaks of this rich young man, this rich young ruler, some of the story says, and he comes to Jesus and he tells Jesus all the stuff, man, I have kept all of your commands. Like I know everything about you. I've kept it all since I was a kid. All right, and, and Jesus responds to him. A lot of people think like Jesus is rebuking him. No, Jesus responds. He like hypes him up. Jesus is like, man, that's awesome. I love that you're doing that. But hey, here's one thing, though, that I've noticed. Here's one thing that I see that's missing. He said, now go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the Bible says that the young man walks away from Christ. He walks away from the grace giver. And he hangs his head low. Because he had so much stuff. I can get to a lot. I can unpack a lot in that, but we don't got time. We got to get y'all home. We got another service that's coming in, all right? But what I do know is this. He had an upward calling, but he had a downward craving. Christ is not saying that every one of us needs to sell all of our stuff and give it to the poor. He's saying no. He's saying this, this dude has tried to mask the fact that he has another God by keeping all of these commands. But you cannot serve God and, and mammon, God and money at the same. You can't serve two masters. You must choose. And so he's calling that on the young man and he just couldn't take it and so he left. Because it looked authentic. I kept all of your commands, but it was counterfeit to the Lord. I went to H-E-B the other day, and how many know H-E-B doesn't got Apple Pay? I remember that every time I go, you know what I mean? I'm just like, come on, God. There's somebody that works at H-E-B here. Can we get Apple Pay going, please? Sometimes I'm in a bind, and I left the cash at home, and I left the card, and I got a license, and I got a phone. I'm trying to make something happen. I'm trying to give you money, guys. Come on. Help me help you. You know what I'm saying? But I did have cash on this occasion. I hand the H-E-B, the clerk, I hand her a $50 bill. And what do you do? What do they do whenever you hand them a hundred or a $50 bill? Yep. See, everybody in here doing it. They put it up to the light, right? You're looking at it because they're looking for a little bitty strip that's on the inside of that bill that, that, that lets them know whether this bill is, is, is fake or authentic. They're putting it up there because they know something. They know something. They can tell whether it's authentic or counterfeit, not by what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. And so what they're looking for is what's on the inside of this bill. And what God is looking for is, is, is what, what Samuel, First Samuel says when he says that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Here, here, here's the concerning thing, the concerning reality about our faith. Jesus says in Matthew 7 that on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast devils out in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew who you were because it looked authentic on the outside. 
but on the inside it was counterfeit. And so I get pricked by this reality because I feel like there are things in my life that I am not adequately worshiping God with. And in fact, I would say that I'm not, it's not that I'm hesitant, it's that I'm reluctant. And that's the problem. Because God deserves all of our worship. So my question to you today is, what area of worship are you keeping for yourself? What area of worship are you unwilling to give to God? Now we're going to end this message in a little bit of a different way because I want to end it with a little bit of reflection. And I'm going to put a statement here on this screen. It simply says, I will worship God with my, fill in the blank. And so what I want you to do for the next 30 seconds is I want you to ponder this. I've given you enough of the gospel, enough of the word of God for you to figure this out pretty quick. In fact, it's probably been popping in your head a few times as you're trying to reconcile your walk with God, as you're trying to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. All of that's good and all of that's beautiful and that's where we should be when we're, when we're learning about the word of God. It should be tweaking some things inside of us, right? Pricking some things inside of our heart. I want you to, to, to evaluate it and make this statement. I will worship God with my blank. Now here's the only rules that I have. You can't say life because that's a cop out. All right? You can't say heart because your brothers and sisters can't really judge that well. All right? And you can't say future because that's a given. You're a believer, you're a Christian, that's a given. All right? So none of those three things. I want you to get more specific than that. Because the reality is, is if, if you won't worship God with your time, how are you going to worship him with your life? How are you worshiping him with your heart if you won't worship him with your money? Or you won't worship him with your sex life? Hello, somebody. Or you won't worship him with your decisions? You won't worship him with your business? You won't worship him with your effort, with your merit? So... I want you to contemplate this, but here, I'm going to give you mine, all right? Let me tell you what sucks about being a preacher, is that before this message convicts you, it convicts me. God dishes it out, of, so by the time I deliver it to you, it's a lot softer than when God dished it out on me, all right? And so I have to answer this question too, and I'll tell you what my word is. I will worship God with my submission. That's my word. And I won't, I won't unpack that because it's between me and God, but I will say this. There are things in my life in this season that God has asked me to do that I have fought him on every inch of the way. And I'm a pastor, right? But there's a reluctancy to submit to God. And he's convicted me about those areas, and so I'm processing that. Because I want this to be the season where I submit to God, where I surrender everything to God and what he is asking me to do. What is it for you? I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now. Just process that statement. What would you fill that with? I will worship God with my Some of y'all didn't take that long. Some of y'all like, no, I already know. That's awesome. That's how I felt too. I just, I tried to say it was something else, but it wasn't something else. And I had to, who would say, who would say over here, who in my student section? Raymond, what, what is it? Submission. Submission and obedience. Come on, right on. Man. Wise young man there. Dijon, what do you say? Your past. Ooh. How about you need that one? Awesome. Pastor Ken, what is it? My thoughts. Man, come on. It's like, I want to give it all. I want to worship God with all of it. I want to worship God with all. We all have something, y'all. We all have something that we're holding, and God wants it all. And so here's the thing. Here's the reality for us. Philippians says that 
on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? Every tongue is going. There is going to be a day when everyone will worship God. But for many, it will be too late. So I'm determined that I'm going to worship God now. That I'm going to to worship God in the here and now. And that my family is going to be worshipers of God. And for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord because God is worthy to be worshipped. So with everyone standing, I'm going to pray over us today. That as we're navigating this in our lives and we're navigating this in our walk and we're navigating this in our week to come, it's like, God, what things can I do to worship you in this area of my life? I'm here to tell you that it's not going to change overnight, but over time it will. And you're going to see victory in these different areas of your life. But with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to pray for you, and then I'm going to speak to those who don't know Jesus following that. But, Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room, every believer, every child of God, Lord, who knows that there's an area of life that they haven't submitted to you, God, that there's an area where they haven't been worshiping you, God. I pray right now, Lord, that you would give them the ability by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to overcome. That, God, every every thought, every every deed, God, every, every action, Lord, it will be used to glorify you, God, and that they will see victory in these areas of life, Lord. Now, we don't do this because we simply want victory, God. We do this because we want to accurately glorify you. We want to glorify you with every aspect of our life, God. So I just pray that by your spirit, you will lead us. Give us opportunities to overcome in this area. Give us opportunities to reveal, God, uh, your glory to others, Lord, and bless every person here with the ability and the power to worship you with every aspect of their lives in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed. If you are in this room today and you're like, man, the reason why I don't worship God is because he's not my God. But I realize in this talk today, that I have a sin of pride or that I'm locked in sin. It may be a multitude of sins, but the sin that sends you to hell is not the drug addiction, it's not the sex, it's not, it's not the pornography, it's not. The sin that sends you to hell is the sin of unbelief, that you have no relationship, that Jesus Christ is not your Lord. But today you want to change that through the message today, because today really was truly the gospel wrapped up in a sermon about worship. But the question is, who will you worship on that day? Who will you worship? If you're here in this place and that's you and you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, and I want you to understand, what I'm not saying is, if you're here today and you would like to have an augmented life with Jesus, no, this isn't an augmented life. This is an abandonment of your life and you are receiving his life. That's what Christianity is about. Christianity isn't about making you feel better, all right? Christianity is about determining who you will worship, who you will glorify. So I want you to get it straight before you raise your hand because I don't want you to be fooled into what you're saying yes to. But if you're here today and you know you're a sinner and you want to repent of your sin and you want to give your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask that you would lift one hand in the sky right now all over this room. Come on. Yes, thank you. And keep your hand up for me if you will. Just all of the, I want to make sure that I've been obedient to what God has asked me to do. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. All over this room, there are people who are like, no, today's the day of change. Today is the moment I draw the line, not in the stand. I'm carving a line in the concrete like Jesus is going to be my Lord. You may put your hand down. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's a good thing. I can help you with the confession of your mouth. That's what we're about to do. I can't help you with the belief in your heart. But I do believe that as you're standing up here in front of everybody and you're lifting that hand, you're lifting it because you believe it in your heart. You're making this declaration that I believe this. So as we pray this together, because I'm going to have the whole church pray it with me. For those of you who are saved, it's just a celebration. It's an affirmation of your faith. But for those of you who lifted your hands, this prayer is the game changer. Your name is going to be written in the Lamb's Book of life you're going to have a reservation in heaven but more than that you're going to have Christ here on earth and you're going to worship him freely and wholly because he is worthy so let's say this together Lord Jesus I am a sinner today I turn from my sin and I turn to you I believe that you lived for me I believe that you died for me and I believe that you rose again so that I could have new life I receive that life today. 
and I call you my Lord from this day forward in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Come on, can we just celebrate everyone who made that decision?